got about uh, 25,000 homeless people in the state of Washington today, and we know how much students are struggling with student housing as well. So what we are proposing to do, in answer to your question, Parsa, we propose to, to basically build $4 billion worth of housing for Washingtonians. This is the scale we need. Uh, you can't do it for less because when you got 25,000 people who are homeless, uh, it costs money to build housing. Now, the good news, when you do it, you get an asset. You get a house. The money just doesn't fritter away. You're actually converting it to housing, just like when you buy a house or you build a house. And so just like getting a mortgage, we've asked to do a bond. The bond will be voted on by the people of the state of Washington. But first, we need the legislators to authorize that to go to the voters for a vote for this $4 billion. And this is a large investment, but only a large investment will do. You know, it's interesting, we just were over at the Evergreen Commons, which is this beautiful a housing project over here. It's just gorgeous. They have about 50 units, uh, which is great, good progress. Um, and, and the county's making good progress about homelessness uh, for, for youth homelessness. But I asked them, how many do you need? They said 765. So even with this large development that we've done, we're still so far short to actually meet the housing needs. And that's not including the students who are struggling to be able to pay their rent. So we need to do a lot, and I'm asking legislators to step up to the plate and help. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, thank you so much for that insightful question. Um, so my name is Elio Van Gordon, and I'm the president of the Campus Climate Coalition here. I'm a senior ES politics major, and I'm originally from Overland Park, Kansas. Um, I am really interested in talking about maybe more so some like climate emotions. Um, so did you say emotions? Emotions, yeah. Oh, this yeah. is a very important subject. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So as a young person who's about to enter the world. Um, and presented with daunting climate questions, um, I'm concerned, I'm angered, and feeling a lot of grief. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what you have to say to young people in the state of Washington who are feeling these emotions. Well, first off, thank you for your leadership. First I do is say thank you for people, uh, you got a couple, couple, maybe four climate warriors here. So thank you for your generation to be the smartest generation in Washington history. You're the most adept at understanding climate science. You're the most committed to doing something about climate change. You're the most uh, uh, innovative generation in Washington state history. So thanks to your generation to arriving just in the nick of time to save us. So we're glad, we're glad that you're here. I think this issue of climate emotions is a really important one, and I'll tell you why. Um, we understand the science, how daunting it is. We understand that we're gonna see some changes in our, in our biosphere no matter what, no matter how successful you are, because a lot of this is baked in. And I think it is a very important um, initiative to get people to be more action oriented and confident rather than feeling rather than surrendering to despair and what i have what i've been saying is that the antidote to despair and there is a reason for despair when you understand how threatening this is but the antidote to despair is action when you feel down when you feel uh, challenged when you feel helpless the antidote for that is not aspirin. Um, it's, it's not a necessarily even beer. It is action. And so what I am asking all of us to do is to find out how we in our own world can take action. I can take action as a governor by proposing the most successful climate policies in, this, in the United States, which we've done. Legislators can take action by passing the best climate laws in the United States, which they have done. Mayors can help develop, uh, you know, low carbon transportation systems and help people getting efficiency housing, which is going on. Students can be active by running for office as soon as they can and voting and urging their legislators to take action. All of us have some action that we can take in our individual lives as well. Right. So we can, you know, uh, use electric cars uh, rather than gas guzzlers. Uh, we can we can use energy efficient lighting. There's a million things that we can do in our individual lives as well. So I think you're putting your finger on a really important point. And what I'm offering people is a way to get on the bus and, and take action because you'll feel better. It'll make you happier. You'll make you it'll, you'll be more confident. You'll make more friends. You know, when you get involved in the climate fight, you make friends, right? You get to meet fellow climate warriors. 
So it's a winning team to get on, and I'm, and I'm glad you are uh, here here at, at Whitman. Very excited about the work you're doing. Thank you, Governor. Um, I wanted to introduce myself and tell you a little bit more about me. Um, my name is Lindsay Pacena Little Sky. I'm a first year here at Whitman College, and I'm actually the college's first round of scholars of the Sonata Scholarship, which means I'm a full ride student here. And with that being said, I am a community member of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the lands that Whitman College sits on, and I'm a descendant of the Ogallala Lakota Nation in South Dakota, and a descendant of the Hopi Nation in Arizona, and enrolled in the San Felipe Pueblo Tribe in New Mexico. Mm. And that being said, also, I am a dual college sport athlete here. I play soccer and lacrosse. Um, and I am the Indigenous Peoples Education and Culture Club president here at Whitman College. I also work as the admissions receptionist here on campus. And I am also have a little bit of experience in tribal leadership as I have served as the CTR Youth Council Leadership um, Chairwoman for six years um, until I served out and now I am a mentor. So climate um, change and climate, um, just attention to climate is something that's been um, a priority of mine that is, as it is important to our culture as indigenous people, mm -hmm. which leads me to ask you a question about housing. Um, I'm very appreciative of the benefits of housing urban development as it is um, extremely beneficial to indigenous communities. Although it's apparent that the guidelines are oppressive considering um, HUD only accommodates low income people. Um, so with that being said, any individual in a household who chooses to benefit their livelihood by obtaining a job or by attending higher education is um, trapped in the guidelines that they can't do so because then they become out of the um, the, the low income, the eligibility. Yeah, right. And so <clears throat> with that being said, indigenous people want to be self-sufficient, but the guidelines kind of hinder them to do so. So I wanted to ask if there's any way to, I guess, adapt those guidelines or what you uh, what you have to say about that. Well, first off, I, I just want to say that I'm jealous of your life as an athlete and a leader and everything else. The only thing you haven't done is win an Oscar yet. So, <laughs> so I look forward to your future. Uh, thanks for your leadership in so many ways. This is a really important issue because we need to be attentive to the housing challenges, not just for the folks who are homeless right now, but for the folks who are working 40 hours a week trying to pay rent and can't make rent. So we have to build housing for working families as well as those who are very low income. And this is very important because we haven't done this. And if you don't build housing for working families, they just can bid up the rent if they can. And then the folks at the lower end of the scale become homeless. So in this proposal that we're making of this $4 billion, we're proposing that a significant portion of that go to working families like the people you're talking about that otherwise would not qualify for some of these low income grants. So we need to build housing throughout the whole spectrum of, of the housing uh, ladder, if you will. Because if you don't take care of the whole spectrum and build housing, people just bid the next person down the ladder, the rent goes up and they fall off the ladder. So uh, there's a large coalition of groups that are supporting uh, our proposal. And what they have kind of come together is about half the dollars would be used for very low income folks, many of whom are homeless today. About 30% would be used for what we call working family housing of the folks you're addressing. About 15% for help for uh, behavioral health and chemical addiction services. So that these folks who do have problems can get help because they need that help. They have to have housing so they can get that help, but they need that help with psychologists and chemical addiction treatment. Uh, and so that's kind of the prioritization array of, of folks who've come together around that. So your point is really well taken. I appreciate it. I appreciate um, uh, the, the stresses of being a college student. I went broke in my freshman year. I went broke in once as a freshman, and I wrote, went broke a second time as a senior. <laughs> so I'm very uh, sensitive to that, and I'm glad you're making it through. I know you're gonna be the next William O. Douglas who, do, you, do people read Go East, young man, here when you, when you start as a, as a, a new member? I highly recommend it. So this is a guy who graduated from Whitman in what, 34, 33 or something. Uh, got on a, 
uh, went to Columbia Law School and the way he paid for his trip to Columbia Law School in New York is that he got a, a job shepherding a freight car full of sheep. That's how he paid for his trip to Columbia and ended up one of the most prolific people in the U.S. Supreme Court. So anyway, that's my recommendation. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good read. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing, Governor. Thank you. I look forward to your future. Thank you. There'll be an Oscar somewhere in your future. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually really interesting because my grandfather, um, he was the first uh, Native American to be actually filmed. Um, really? Yeah, his name is uh, It's a Little Sky. So if you look at him up, he comes up as the first Native American to ever be put on the screen. So, so what was his first name? Edsel Little Sky. Edsel Little Sky. Yep, and his wife was Don Little Sky. Yeah. They were the first. Well, we will check it out. You know, we have a long tradition of, of tribal members. So was his name Samson, who was the who was who played the role of chief in, um, in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Have you ever seen this movie? <laughs> so he was, I believe, a Yakima tribal member, and he had a huge role in, in this wonderful movie, which was filmed when I was a student at Willamette Law School down in Oregon. So... Check wow. it out. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Wow! Thanks for sharing. Check out Chief. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Governor Ainsley, it's a it's such an honor to be here. My name is Fraser Moore. I'm a senior biology environmental studies major, mm -hmm. and I'm originally from South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also the interim president of the student body, and I've been involved in climate action through most of my years here at Whitman. Um, and I'm also really passionate about ecology. I'm studying the interactions between uh, insects and flowering plants in agaric mm -hmm. woodland just east of the Cascades mm -hmm. and just really passionate about ecology and climate action and the intersections of land and how people relate to land. Um, and my question is thinking big about uh, climate accountability and the context for this is that Whitman ranks last out of 10 peer institutions and sustainability rankings. And as students, we've asked ourselves how best to institute climate accountability and ensure that we are being responsible citizens in the Walla Walla Valley and in the scary time of a rapidly changing climate. Mm -hmm. And uh, economists broadly agree that a carbon tax might be the most effective policy at reducing carbon emissions. How However, on a sort of national scale, uh, carbon tax is often politically un unpalatable. Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are about institutions like Whitman self-imposing a carbon tax for a climate accountability and then using that tax money, uh, that self-imposed tax money to reinvest in sustainability projects on campus or in, in a broader institution. Interesting question. We, we do have a, a pricing model in our state, as you know. So yep. we, we, instead of a tax, uh, we don't have a tax, but we have a cap and invest program, which is using the market to set the price, if you will. And that just went into effect last Tuesday. We had a very successful first wow. auction. It, it worked out very, very well for all of us. So I'm encouraged by that success of this program. And it is a way to generate billions of dollars that can be used for clean energy, which we're going to do. And I'm very happy about the structure. We have the best uh, uh, pricing system in the United States in part because we made a large commitment to disproportionately affected communities. So we have 35% uh, of all of them have to be used in disproportionately affected communities and 10% for tribal uh, uh, communities as well that have been unduly affected by pollution. So I'm very excited about what, about what we're doing. Now that's not all we're doing. We also have a low carbon fuel standard to encourage uh, low carbon transportation systems and give consumers uh, less polluting fuel. We have, we're the first state in the nation to require people have a heat pump so you don't have to connect the dirty fossil gas when you, when you get a home. We have a 100% clean electrical grid, grid requirement and our transportation plans are very, very much oriented to clean uh, systems of transportation. So we're doing a lot of different things, not just a pricing mechanism, if you will. As far as for campuses to do that, I, I don't want to intrude into Whitman politics. That's something for you to be a leader on. I would just encourage you to be vocal. You essentially would be, in some sense, uh, having part of your tuition going to direct clean energy investments. Uh, I hardly can be against that, but that's a decision for you to make, and I encourage you to be um, uh, bold. Let me ask you, though, about the world of insects. I'm very concerned that there appears to be a collapse of insect populations in many, many communities. What's your read on that? Is this real, and what do you think the causes are? 
Um, yes, it's real. We are seeing rapid declines in insect populations across the planet. And um, that's partially to do with industrial agriculture, uh, declining habitats due to rapid industrialism um, and encroachment into um, biodiverse spaces. And so it is a radical problem as insects literally run our world. Uh, all our foods, well, most of our food systems run on insects and insect pollination unless they're big agriculture and big monoculture whereby a pathogen is just waiting to wipe out right. a lot of our agriculture. So we're in this delicate position where insect populations are declining and but we also know what to do about it. We plant plants and we be responsible citizens in the place we are. And also turning our attention to Whitman, <clears throat> we have large swathes of grass everywhere and it's a colonial aesthetic that's been copied and pasted across the world. Mm -hmm. um, in, in South Africa, my, my, my school that I went to looked very similar to Whitman in many ways. We had large sort of grass banks, um, which is irresponsible in this climate, which is pretty arid. The mm -hmm. shrub step in Walla Walla is mm -hmm. not conducive to grass. We have to apply a lot of fertilizers mm -hmm and uh, water it through the summer extensively. And so what people can do to help insects is plant responsibly and plant biologically significant plants mm -hmm. that are highly available in nectar and pollen uh, to assist native insects who are vital in uh, pollinating um, and sustaining plants around the world, but also the food systems that we rely on. So. I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts. Well, first off, I really appreciate your leadership on this subject. Now, here's the good news. You can change your aesthetics, right? These things are not like in our DNA. This yeah. is, we can change the cultural expectations of our homes and, and, and space. So it is possible to do that. I have to tell you, though, I'm still a little bit perplexed of the insect decline. And I'll tell you why. So, you know, I've been around for 72 years. When I used to drive around eastern Washington, your windshield would be covered yeah, with absolutely. bugs at night, right? So you just, you're not experiencing this now. And yet, I, I'm not sure I understand that it's, that it's just agricultural practices because we were, I'm not sure we're cultivating more acres than we did when I was 10 years of age. So I just wonder if something else dramatic is going on other than just land use patterns, that there's, whether it's climate or some bacterial agent or something. I, I'm very troubled by this because I don't know exactly what's happening. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a multitude of factors. I think it's sort of everything combining together. Mm -hmm. um, so with r uh, rising temperatures, uh, spring is coming earlier, right. which um, most insects in this area pupate and basically go dormant over the winter mm -hmm. and then explode into action mm -hmm. um, in, in the summer. And that's when they're mating and recombining and <clears throat> pollinating um, and then go dormant again. Those patterns are shifting pretty dramatically with temperatures rising earlier and yeah. sooner. Yeah. Um, but in addition, we've seen in the last 70 years how the rapid expansion of chemical use has right. just exploded right. post-World War II. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of insects are being, uh, so Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, for mm -hmm. example, tracking bird decline and relating that to DDT usage. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of this relates back to yeah. chemical usage and artificial. Well, I'm um, very glad you're doing biology so you can get to the, the heart of these answers because we certainly need them. And I'm, I'm glad we got bright people coming along. Thank you. So congratulations. Yeah, um, I just want to again like emphasize some like Fraser has done so much work um, on the native plant side here mm -hmm. um, and we've had a lot of momentum this year in terms of climate action like mm -hmm. and advocacy on campus. Great. It's really timely for you to be here. We are so mm -hmm. excited um, to have you here truly. I thought maybe I'd learn something if I came here. So <laughs> maybe maybe I will. Yeah, yeah, I think we we've we've been doing, I know you said you didn't want to insert yourself into, into Whitman politics, but you know, I think we've really, um, we've really been advocating struggling. We've got petitions going, resolutions going through the student body. Mm -hmm. um, we're really advocating for Whitman to prepare for the future. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of thought going on around that. There's a lot of activism going That's on great. right now. Yeah, we're really excited to have That's you. That's great. Now listen, I want to I want to radicalize you while I'm here though. Great. Don't be limited to the Whitman campus. You all have voices to vote to get to know your legislators, your senators, your governors, your presidents. I encourage you to be as active as humanly possible. If you all know your legislators, um, this is a good time to talk to them about this issue. 
we have had profound success in our climate policies, but we can always do more in the state of Washington. And certainly the federal government can. We're still way ahead of the federal government. We're glad that uh, President Biden, Senator Murray, Maria Canwell, and others have led a tremendous climate inflation. Uh, it's called the Inflation Reduction Act. It's really a climate bill. But there's still more to be done. Uh, we're only halfway to do what we need to do. So anyway, I encourage you to be politically active, starting with voting. Yeah, I mean, thinking thinking about like outside of Whitman, like as of yesterday, we saw that the Willow Project just got approved by mm -hmm. the Biden administration. Yep. Um, what are your thoughts on that and how do you plan to take action? Well, uh, big question. My, my view is, is that I don't believe that we can make major investments in, in large scale fossil fuel based infrastructure. We just cannot do that. And the reason is it locks you into 50 years of, of usage of this infrastructure. And that is incompatible with meeting our, our national goals. You, ju you just can't do it. And when you're in a hole, you really should stop digging. So by doing additional major fossil fuel infrastructure, you just create an insurmountable hurdle yourself to decarbonize the economy. That's my general proposition. Um, I don't know what the administration was thinking. I'm disappointed in their decision. But I, the one thing I don't know is how legally required they were to do this permit. Uh, I've heard some argue that they were legally required to do that. I haven't gotten deeply into this, but we have multiple things where we're going to have to say no to these infrastructure projects. We have one that is a proposed gas pipeline that would go through Washington State and Oregon. Uh, I have uh, uh, rigorously opposed that, just wrote a letter last week uh, to the federal government asking them to deny the permits for that. I think that, that is the right decision. When you look at the decarbonization that we have to do, to think you're gonna, you're already struggling under this giant load on the back of the neck, our necks, which is the carbon budget that we have to rid ourselves of. To think you're gonna take on another, uh, you know, millions of megatons of carbon dioxide, that does not make sense given the current condition. And frankly, there's not a need for it because the technology is changing so rapidly. Uh, the, the battery improvements, the electric car improvements, the solar improvements, the cost of wind continues to come down. When you look at that technological curve, there is not a need to invest in these ancient sources of, of energy. There just isn't. We have these alternatives available. We have to maximize them. So, I, I you know, I, generally, I just think that's a rule we have to adopt. It, you can't do major fossil fuel infrastructure at this point or minor infrastructure as well. There's no reason we should be hooking up to more fossil fuel gas to, to you know, for our cook stoves at this point, which, by the way, increases the asthma rates in your home, probably 15 or 20 percent increasing asthma rates in the homes that have, you know, gas stoves, for instance. So there's no reason to do that right now. When we have electric heat pumps, we have passive heating for our homes that's available we should use it so um, i hope we do better thank and by you by the way having said that i'm very appreciative of president biden's leadership though look this inflation reduction act he pulled a rabbit out of the hat to be able to get this at the last moment 360 billion dollars of climate investment this is a tremendous achievement and disappointed as we are in the willows project we shouldn't forget you know, who's been leading the country, uh, particularly compared to Brand X, frankly. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm very happy that he's president of the United States. Thank you. I think it means a lot of your words to talk about the damage that infrastructure does to our environment. And that leads me to the topic of dams. And I'm very appreciative of what you and Governor Murray have to say about the Lower Snake River Dam and that we need to find a better way to um, to replace that energy. And so currently the Youth Council has a petition to call President Biden to a call to action, um, starting with a meeting. We're sitting at 24,500 signatures out of 25,000, so we're nearly there. And so I'll thank you for encouraging um, that movement. And with that being said, I wanted to ask if you're actually aware that um, the use and operations of dams directly impact our nation's uh, reserved rights in Article 3 of our Treaty of 1855 by impairing the Yakima Nation's treaty reserved rights to fish in all usual and accustomed places and to have sufficient catch when we go fishing. The people of the Columbia River and the salmon species have faced the burden of hydro systems and are facing increased environmental issues and climate change. And with that being sa said, we've had to face these 
like con like these current um issues just on the hand on the spot and we've had to learn how to our best to face these challenges and now tribes have success successfully managed Colombian basin fisheries for millennia and today we are leading experts on salmon habitat hatchery harvest and hydro system passage and so I wanted to know if can as well as our culture highly honoring nature um, I wanted to know if that is there any plan to incorporate indigenous leaders into land and energy restoration? Yes, I came to listen to you. So we are incorporating <laughs> tribal leadership right now. We have a really good working relationship with our tribes in the state. We, we have led the country in having a, a sovereign to sovereign relationship with our with our uh, uh, tribal leaders. Uh, we, had, we have a centennial accord so that once a year we meet uh, for multi-days to talk about all of our issues together. We have so many. And we've been very successful. The, the success of our tribal enterprises has been very, very uh, gratifying to me. Uh, the poverty that, that so many folks uh, and tribal communities had when I was growing up was, was so painful to me. And now to see the successful a lot of these tribes because they're making really good decisions is a joy. And there, by the way, it's not just helping tribal people, it's helping non-tribal people. You know, 80% of the people who work for the tribes are non-tribal people. So seeing that success is really important to our state, it's important to me. I think we're having really good relationship. When it comes to the dams, I'm really glad that we've got to work with Patty Murray to look for a way to replace the energy and the transportation. We're actively looking, how do we replace that so we can take down uh, breach the dams. We do have to find replacement, though. I think it's pretty clear that you can't just remove them and, and, and not replace the energy sources. We need clean energy sources to replace those dams, and we're actively looking for them. So I appreciate uh, Senator Murray's uh, leadership on this, too, and yours. Thank you, Government. Um, and so just for context, again, Whitman College has committed to being climate neutral by 2050 Great. Um, per our 2016 Climate Action Plan. But 2030 is the date that the IPCC recognizes as the essential date for carbon neutrality mm -hmm. to ensure that we don't sort of tip over the precipice of mm -hmm. uh, the, um, this climate disaster that we're facing. Um, and as students, we feel a great urgency to push this forward. But Whitman's administration has been slow to respond. And so in lieu of that, I'm wondering what the biggest political barriers that you faced um, are in the way of climate neutrality and just general climate mitigation in your experience and your leadership being a climate activist over the years? I would say two things. One, sort of broad scale, one narrow scale. It's a lack of vision of understanding that we can have an economy that's not based on fossil fuels. And there's a fear that if we try to do that, that we will no longer have transportation, we'll no longer have health care, we'll no longer have a warm place to, to hang our hat at night. And that is an unjustified fear because I believe humans are unbelievably innovative and creative and that we can build a clean energy future. So I would say we simply have to build confidence in our ability to get this job done. That's the broad scale impediment. The narrow one is that we've had too many politicians who have felt, you know, they've, they've got to bow down to the fossil fuel gods and, are, and, are, and, and sort of take their orders from the oil and gas and coal industries. And that's been a reality. And the parties, unfortunately, uh, you know, I won't name which party has been responsible for that. You have to figure that out yourself. Yeah. But, it, it, but that's been the narrow sc scope. And I'd like to say that that will change. I'd like to say this will become a bipartisan effort at some point. But I have some confidence looking around at what we're capable of doing, in part because the generation you represent really gets this. This is deep in your hearts. You have the scientific literacy to understand the consequences of this. You have the innovative entrepreneurial spirit, and you're arriving just in the nick of time. So I, I, I kind of feel humans are going to remain in existence for quite a few more generations uh, because we're going we're gonna to build a clean energy economy. I believe that. Can you really quick um, explain what is your um, administration doing to mitigate the already effects of a climate change that are, are already here. So things that I wish it weren't true. You know, I started to argue about this in 1992 uh, when I ran for Congress in central Washington in Yakima. I used to live in Silo, Washington. 
and I looked at an old flyer that I had, the very first flyer I handed out when I was running for Congress. And it said, um, we need to fight climate change. We need to reduce carbon dioxide pollution. This was 1992 when I first ran for Congress. Had that been the prevailing sentiment in 1992, all those decades ago, we might have avoided a lot of these problems that we are now experiencing. So I wish I'd you know, been king of the world in 1992 and, and we would have got on to fighting it started in 1992. Didn't happen, we lost three decades, unfortunately. But we're here now and we now have the ability to, to uh, you know, build electric cars, build solar plants, keep putting wind up. We can do all those things now to arrest and slow down the rate of change. And this is fully within our power. So we need to feel empowered. We need to feel strong. We need to feel uh, able here. We need to feel that we're gonna work together on these things. So we don't have time to cry over spilt milk here and say, gosh, golly, I wish we'd started earlier. We just gotta get to it. And I'm glad that people at Whitman, including you four, are, are really uh, inspiring me to believe uh, we're gonna do some good work, starting Whitman. All right, thank you so much, Governor. Um, I'm very sure that us four and whoever has been listening to this uh, show really appreciates your efforts in uh, regards to climate, housing, and everything else that you do for the state of Washington. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. Thank I'll you. I'll see you when you guys are presidents and senators. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Thank you, Governor.